everybody welcome back to my channel if you're new here my name is Megan and I am doing the love there challenge by Stephen and Alex Kendrick and it is a 40-day marriage devotional challenge and today we are on 22 if you haven't seen my other videos make sure to go and watch them also from day one all the way actually I have two videos before that um, kind of introducing and talking about the love dare I also have a love dare quiz that you can take beforehand so go make sure to go watch those videos I will have the I'll have the playlist at the end of this video but this is day number 22 and it is love is faithful and it is I will be troth you to be in faithfulness then you will know the Lord that's Hosea 220 as Christians love is the basis of our whole identity as God's children he gives us the name beloved which means we are the ones who are unconditionally loved by God which uh, the focus of our lives becomes loving God and loving others Jesus clarified God's greatest command for us by saying you shall love the Lord with all your heart your soul your strength your mind and your and your neighbor as yourself and that's Luke 10 27 our love for each other is supposed to be how people distinguish us as Christ disciples John 13 35 it is the root and the ground of our existence that's Ephesians 3 17 meant to be expressed with passion and fervency 1st Peter 4 8 love is an exercise we are to abound in more 1st 1 Thessalonians 3.12 Always getting better at it, becoming increasingly defined by it. Sorry, I'm a, I have a trick-or-treater in April. Yes? Trick-or-treat. Smell my feet. Give me something good to eat. If you don't, I don't care. I'll pull down your underwear. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Okay. So if love is what we were created to share, what do you do when love is rejected? How do you handle it when the one to whom you pledged your life stops accepting the love you called to give? The account of Prophet Hosea is one of the most remarkable in the Bible. Against all logic and impropriety, God instructed him to marry a prostitute. He wanted Hosea's marriage to show what heaven's unconditional love looks like towards us. Hosea's union with Gomer produced three children, but as expected, this woman who had a long made her living in immorality was not content to stay faithful to one man. So Hosea was left to deal with a broken heart and the shame of abandonment. He had loved her, but she had spurned his love. They had cl grown close, but now she had been disloyal and adulterous, rejecting him from the lust of total strangers. Time passed and God had spoken to Hosea again, telling him to go and reaffirm his love for the woman who had been repeatedly unfaithful. By now, however, she had reached a new low and was being sold a dirty, unwanted slave. But Hosea paid the price for her redemption and brought her home. Yes, she had treated his love with contempt. She had dealt treacherously with his heart. Yet he had welcomed her back into his life, expressing unconditional love towards her. And this story of Hosea, it actually um, is, there's a fav my favorite book out there. It was written by Francine Rivers, and it's um, called Redeeming Love. If you haven't read it, you need to go check it out. If you like the story about um, Hosea, um it's one of my favorite books it's really really good so go check that out um let's keep going it says this is a true story but god used it to paint a lasting picture of his love for us through hosea's actions we see a god who showers his favor on us without measure though we don't pay attention in return at times we have acted shamefully and deemed his love an intrusion and if it's just keeping us from what we really want James and serenading us in the background. Sorry about that. 
We have rejected him in many ways, even at receiving his gift of internal salvation, and yet he still loves us. He still remains faithful. Even so, his love doesn't keep from calling us to account for our mistreatment of him. We pay more of a price for our rejection than we often realize. We will still, yet he still chooses to respond with grace and mercy. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have the model of what rejected love does. It stays faithful. Jesus called his followers to this kind of love in the passage known as the Sermon on the Mount. He said to love your enemies, do not do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat, mistreat you. And that's Luke 6, 27 to 28. And I really like that one and I underline it, so I'm going to read it again. It is love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And that's Luke 6, 27 through 28. After all, if you love those who love you, what credit is it to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is it to you? For even sinners do the same. That's Luke 6, 32 through 33. He said, love your enemies and do good and lend expect and and lend, expecting nothing returned, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. And that's Luke 6, 35. From the vantage point of the wedding altar, you would never have dreamed that the person you married might later become to you a kind of enemy, one you would need to love as a difficult, one you would need to love as a difficult and even painful sacrifice and yet far too often in marriage and relationship the relationship does indeed dwindle down to that level even to the point of betrayal or sadly to unfaithfulness for many this is the beginning of the end some respond by rapidly moving toward a tragic divorce others more proactive of their re reputation in the eyes of others decide to keep the charade going but they have no intention of liking it or trying any harder, much less of truly loving again. This is not the model, however, for the follower of Christ. If love is to be like his, it must even when it, when it overtures or return unwanted. And for your love to be like that, it must be his love to begin with. The reason why you still have hope of giving undeserved love to your spouse is because God has given his undeserved love to you repeatedly, enduringly. Love is often expressed the most to those who deserve it the least. Ask him to fill you with a kind of love only he can provide and purpose to give to you your mate in a way that reflects your gratefulness to God for loving you. That's the beauty of redeeming love. That's the power of faithfulness. All right, today's dare is love is a choice, not a feeling. It is an initiated action, not an impulsive reaction. Choose today to be committed to love, and if your spouse has lost most of their interest in receiving it, say to them today in words similar to these, I love you, period, and no matter what you do, I will never stop loving you. And then it goes on to say, why is this kind of love impossible without the love of Christ beating in your heart? How does his presence within you enable you to enable you to love even when it's primarily one-sided? And I went ahead and did this and I said, Dave and I don't have this problem, thankfully. But if someone was ugly to you every day, wasn't interested in loving you anymore, and or cheats on you, it would be really hard to love them. Only with the grace of God could you love that person. You love this person because God loves you and you agreed to love and obey through thickness and thin. Or you agreed to love through thickness and thin, richer or poor, and sickness and health until death to us part. When you, God, married, un married under God. And a, co a Bible verse that kind of goes along this is, I feel like I have a mouse in here. James, a high squeak. Motherhood right here. <laughs> um, I have chosen the faithful way, and that's Psalms 119.30. 
And then someone called named Bob said, it's been three weeks and she's starting to notice the difference. So, all right, that is it for today. Continue watching and I'll have day 23. <laughs> Welcome back to the video. Today we are going to probably the book. Okay, now we're on day 23, and it is Love Always Protects. And it says, Love Always Protects, and it's 1 Corinthians 13, 7. No, 13, 7. No couple gets... No couple okay. that... No couple gets married as enemies. They tie the knot filled with hopes of a lifetime of love. But the high rate of divorce reveals that after a couple walks down the aisle, they are stepping into a minefield of marital obstacles that can take either of them down. Sadly, every marriage has enemies out there. Hey. That's why love compels us to be on alert and guard when it is most dear and precious to us. To be willing to step up and fight some battles passionately. Those that pertain to protecting your spouse and the strength of our union. Many things can destroy our relationship unless our love puts an armor and picks up a sword to protect its own. Okay, James, you gotta be quiet if you're gonna be in the video, okay? Here, for example, are just a few of the potential attacks you need to be aware of and engage in, constantly protecting your mate and your marriage. Responsibility, not pass passivity, is the key to guarding against the following issues. Misplaced priorities. Any good thing has potential to become a harmful thing if it becomes an all-consuming thing. Friends, hobbies, and work skills must be kept in balance and in the proper place. You protect your home when you're rarely, rarely, rarely there, nor when you're relationally disconnected. Even if your children, while obviously a key priority, should be raised on the foundation of a strong marriage. When parents invert this and prioritize the kids above their marriage, they actually hurt their children in the long run as the marriage is weakened. One of the most commonly heard excuses for divorce is that the, it's best for the children. But what is best for the children is seeing their mom and dad demonstrate unconditional love for each other, keep their commitments, work out their differences, forgive, preserve a legacy of endurance. And I really like that and I underlined it, so I'm going to repeat it again. When parents invert invert and prioritize the kids ab above their marriage they actually hurt their children in the long run and the marriage is weakened one of the most commonly heard excuses for divorce is that it's best for the children but what's best for the children is seeing their mom and dad Im demonstrate unconditional love for each other keep their commitments work out their differences forgive and preserve a legacy of endurance Unhealthy relationships. Not everyone has the material to be a good friend. Not every man you hunt and fish with speaks wisely when it comes to the matters of marriage. Not every woman in your lunch group has a perfect perspective on a commitment and priorities. In fact, anyone who undermines your marriage does not deserve the right to whisper in your ear. Harmful influences. Are you allowing a certain habits to poison your home? Technology, television, and the internet can be a, a productive and enjoyable additions to your life, but they can also invite destructive content to your home and drain away precious countless hours from your family. And I underlined that. Um, and I said, David and I both need to work on this. Um, we both are on our phone, our computers, a lot. And we also don't like that because we want to teach him that um, that it's not good. Are you okay? Uh huh. Okay. Um, it's not good to be on the screen all the time. And unfortunately, now that we're in social distance, social distancing during this quarantine, he is on it a lot. But we think picking up a book and reading will be a good way to 
show James it's good to read, which is, he does love to read, so we're happy with that. But then, just being on screen all the time, I know you know, it does take away your family time that we could be playing together, even though it's a good stress reliever. Okay. Stop be careful and cautious of anything that could deaden your mind or steal your time. Yeah, Sexual temptation. Be on guard at all times from allowing opposite sex relationships at work, at the gym, even at church to draw you emotionally away from one of to whom you have already given your heart. Many divorces are now resulting from unguarded use of social networking sites. Staring at smiling pictures of old friends and old flames can hook you emotionally and deceptively lure you, your heart, away from the love of your life and into the danger zone. Any relationship that's drawing your affection away from your spouse has already gone too far. Wisdom says to be extra guarded around those you find most appealing and attractive. They should be kept at a greater emotional distance. Why? Your love is why. Shame. Everyone deals with some level in inferiority and weakness. And because marriage has a way of exposing it all to, your, to you and your mate, you need to protect your wife as your husband's vulnerability, but never speaking negatively about them in public. And I said, I need to work on this myself. Um, their secrets are your secrets. Your secrets are your, their secrets are your secrets. Unless, of course, these involve destructive behaviors that are putting you, your children, or themselves in grave danger. Generally speaking, love hides the faults of others. It covers their shame. Parasites. With, parasites. Watch out for parasites. A parasite is anything that latches on to you or your partner and sucks the life out of your marriage. They're usually in the form of addictions like gambling, drugs, or pornography. They promise pleasure but grow like a disease and consume more and more of your thoughts, time, and money. They steal away your loyalty and heart from those you love. Marriages rarely survive if, if parasites are present. If you love your spouse, you must destroy any addiction that has your heart. If you don't, it will destroy you. So, as a wife, realize you have a role as protector in your marriage. You must guard your heart from being led away through any novels, magazines or any forms of entertainment to blur your perception of reality and put unfair expectations on your husband. Do your part in helping him feel strong while avoiding talk show thinking that lures your attention away from your family. The wise woman builds her house but the foolish tears it down with her own hands and that's Proverbs 14 1. And and husbands, you are the head of your home. You are one responsible for God for guarding the gate and standing your ground against anything that will threaten your wife or marriage. This is no small assignment. It requires a heart of courage and a head for preemptive action. Jesus said if the head of the house had known at time of the night that the thief was coming, he would have been on alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. And that is Matthew 24, 43. This role is yours. Take it seriously. Okay. So today's dare was remove anything that is hindering your relationship, any addiction or influence that is stealing your affections and turning your heart away from your spouse. Then it says, what did you throw out first? Are there any that need to be go as well? Are there others that need to go as well? What do you hope the removal of these things will do for your marriage and your relationship with God? Anna says, I don't do this on the usual, but I have been known to tease David in public about his faults. I will definitely be working on that. You should always build your husband up, not down, especially with company. I hope that this will make me a better wife and make David and me closer. It will make me closer to God because I will be leaning on Him to help me. That and also like I mentioned earlier in here that and we need to work on um, screen time. Um, we need to learn do that a lot. 
If we're going to be on screen, we need to be on screen when the children are not awake. Um, I, I think that would be the best option. And when they are awake, be able to do more of what needs to be done around the house or spending time with them. So that is my dare today and what I, since I already went ahead and did it, I just share with you. All right, now we are on day number 24 and it is love versus lust. It says, the world is passing away and also it's lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. And that's 1 John 2, 17. Adam and Eve were supplied with everything they needed in the Garden of Eden. They had fellowship with God and intimacy with one another. But after Eve, Eve was deceived by the serpent, she saw the forbidden fruit and set her heart on it. Then Adam joined her sin and they both ate against God's command. That's the progression from eyes to the heart to action and then follow shame and regret. We too have been supplied by God with everything we need for full, productive, enriching life. Jesus promised that our material needs for food and clothing would always be provided to God's children. Matthew 6, 25 through 33. And the Bible goes on and say that we should be content with these. That's 1 Timothy 6, 8. And I said I need to work on this, but I do believe that I've gotten better. I should be content with what I have. Um, God's blessings, however, go so far beyond fundamental needs. He richly lavishes his love, spirit, and word upon us. Yet, like Adam and Eve, we still want more. So we set our eyes and hearts on seeking seeking worldly pleasures. We try to meet legitimate needs in illegitimate ways. For many, it's seeking sexual fulfillment in another person or in pornographic images designed to feel like a real person. We look, stare, and fantasize. We try to be discreet but barely turn our eyes away. And once our eyes are captured by curiosity, our hearts become entangled. Then we act on our lust. We can also lust after money, possessions, power, or prideful ambition. Um, I would say mine would be possessions followed by money. And maybe comes from having that mall come from um, my house fire. I don't want to say a hoard, <laughs> but I do like to hold on to a lot of stuff. Sentimental stuff because of the house fire. Um, right after I graduated high school, um, we had a house fire and we pretty much destroyed like 99% of everything in our house. So now I'm like, I don't want to get rid of stuff because I lost stuff not by choice. And so now by choice, I don't want to get rid of sentimental stuff because because it's it, it hurts. <laughs> um, okay, let me keep going. We see that what others have and what we want. And I see, and I do see a lot of this on YouTube. Um, our hearts are deceived in saying, I could be happy if I only had this. Then we made the decision to go after it. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. And that is 1 Timothy 6, 9. Hello, kitty, kitty. Keep going, Simba. Um, Lust is in opposition in love. Instead of being grateful for what God has given us, we set our hearts on something outside the boundaries of his provisions. Lust makes good things that we don't own into the objects of our future happiness instead of God. And I said I need to remember this and let go of things, not to hoard. <laughs> um, and for a believer, it's a step out of fellowship with God. That's because every potential target of lust... If it's not a child, it's an animal. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Okay, keep walking. Keep going. You usually see Thor. This is Simba this time. Okay, keep walking. Okay. Where was I? Um, that's because of every potential target of lust, whether it's a young co-worker, a film actress, a 
half a million dollar house or a sports car can become obsession and idol in your heart. And I said, I don't believe mine has become an idol, or, uh, just an obsession, has become obsession, not an idol. Please keep walking. Okay. Lust always rest, restedly wants more. What is the source of the wars and fights among you? Don't they come from the cravings that are at war with you? And that's James 4, 11. Regardless of how amazing or appealing your spouse is, lust will make you dissatisfied with them. Lust fuels anger, numbs hearts, and destroys marriages. Rather than, from full, rather than fullness, it leads to emptiness. It's time to expose lust for what it really is, a misguided thirst for satisfaction that only God can fulfill, altering you to the fact that you're not allowing God's love to fill you. When your eyes and heart are on Him, your actions will lead to lasting joy, not to endless cycles of regret and con condemnation. His divine power has granted us to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. For by these He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped to the corruption that is in the world by lust. And that's 2 Peter 1, 3-4. God, God isn't asking you to give up your lust for nothing, leaving you with no comfort or adventure to take their place. He is not denying your pleasure, just redirecting you from simple and unsatisfying things to the pure and greater pleasures found in Him and he and what he provides he wants you to discover that nothing truly satisfies like jesus and i want to repeat it i underlined that so i'll repeat it he wants you to discover that nothing truly satisfies like jesus what has been enticing and luring your eyes and heart away what things in the world are you longing for as your next source of fulfillment and I said, mine is to have a nice home, which I don't think is a bad thing, as long as I don't allow it to become an obsession or an idol. Um, can you admit you don't need them? Are you tired of being lied to by trust? Do I need a nice big house? No, but it would it'd be nice. Um, are you tired of being lied to by the lust? Um, yes. <laughs> um, I think it's like our world we live in um and even being on youtube you see it a lot that people these big houses and you start thinking wow that'd be really nice to have one but i try to be content with what i have because i do love my home and david works hard to pay for our home so i i love it and i think sometimes we don't have a small house we got a, a nice medium-sized house and i feel like Sometimes the bigger it is, it's not as cozy and warm, and I like cozy and warm. And so, it, I really like, I really like our house. But it would be nice to have a. I'm not saying I wouldn't. I'm rambling. I wouldn't say I wouldn't like a big house. And I would try to make it nice, and cozy, and warm that way too. But I'm, I'm pretty content with having a medium home because that's where all the love is. That's where my family is, and that's all where my things are. So. Yeah. Um, let me keep going. Are you fed up with believing that forbidden pleasures are able to keep you happy and content when you know they can't? Then begin setting your heart back on God and partake of the feast of His Word. Let His promises of peace and freedom work their way into your heart. Confess any lust in your heart as sin. And allow the guilt and shame that weighs on you to be replaced by the joy of his forgiveness. Daily receive the unconditional love he has already proven to you through the cross. Focus on being grateful for everything God has already given you rather than choosing discontentment. You'll find yourself so full in what he provides you won't be hungry anymore for the drunk food of lust. And while you're at it, set your eyes and heart on your spouse again. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. Be exhilarated but always with her love. For why should you, my son, be exhilarated with an adulteress and embrace the bosom of a foreigner? 
for the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches all his paths. That's Proverbs 5, 18 through 21. Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's 1 John 2, 15. Lust is the best this world has to offer, but love offers you the best life in the world. Okay, today's dare is end it now. And identify any obsession or object or lust in your life and let go of it. Expose your any lie you're swallowed in pursuing forbidden pleasures and reject it. Lust cannot be allowed to live in a back closet. It must be killed and destroyed today. Focus on thanking God that He and what He provides satisfies you and meet all of your needs. What did you identify as an area of lust? What has this pursuit cost you over time? How has it led you away from the person you want to be? Write about your new commitment to seek God and to seek your spouse rather than seeking any after fullest desires. And I said, I feel, but could be wrong. I don't really lust over anything. If I'm going, if I am wrong, I ask God to show me. I do always want to look at things to add to my home to make it more homey. Decorations. I sometimes may spend more money on it than I should. I don't believe it has led me away from the person I want to be at all. It has actually has brought me closer. I want to have a nice house that's a home that David, my kids, and I love, feel comfortable in and want to be and feel safe. I want to be at and feel safe. Maybe when I decide to go shopping, I'll seek God and think about David before buying anything. But I really don't lust or have a very strong sexual desires towards someone besides my husband. And um, this has a little extra thing in here. And it says by a guy named Rich. And he said, I'm so glad that he put, I'm so glad that God put me through the love there. It has made me a better man, a better father, and a better husband. And another um, Bible verse that goes through uh, with this is, Act as a free man. Man, men, and do not use your freedom as a cover, as a covering for evil. And that's First Peter two sixteen. All right, that is the end of this part of the love dare. If you liked it, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit that bell so you never miss any of our videos. And if you haven't seen my other love dare videos, please go back and watch them. I'll have them. Um, at the end of this video that you can click on the whole playlist. Okay. Or right, I'll see y'all next time. Thanks. Bye.